Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. Today, we're going to be talking about hand sauce. We wanted to thank Mr. How To For You on YouTube. He's been sharing our podcast on all his social platforms, and he has some really interesting uh, home improvement tips. But he, he puts a comic slant on everything, so I, I enjoy on his it. YouTube channel. Yes. Yeah, he's and, great. And his handle is Mr. How To For You, and it's spelled capital M R capital H O W the number two four and capital U, and that's all together, no spaces. The first metal hand saws go back to ancient Egypt, about 3000 BC. No way. And they, and they were making copper saws. Then the Greeks and the Romans saw this. They added a frame to it, so it was much more accurate, easier to cut. So what then, were the Egyptians doing? Just had a blade? Th- they were irritated with their <laughs> saws. In the 1600s, the process of rolling out steel really created a nice wide blade. And they created offset teeth, so it created a little wider groove so that the blade wouldn't bind up. And some of the saws that were created in the late 1800s are pretty much identical to modern saws. Hmm. In the 1700s, in the Ozark and Appalachian Mountains, musicians started using saws as an instrument. Mm -hmm. So they would use a violin bow or a little hammer and hitting and flexing the saw, they created music. So it sounds haunting, almost like the sounds from a science fiction movie. <laughs> so I found this ad for the 1920s. It was a newspaper ad said, Be the life of the party. Play a saw. <laughs> so, so they were selling saws for $4.85. And at the bottom of the ad, it said, Start a saw club in your town. <laughs> so I actually spoke to Peter. He's from musicalsaw.com. And he sells musical saws that you can play. And at the end of the episode, I'll play a a little music from him. (laughs) That's funny. Let's jump into the basics about hand saws. Okay. The most common types of saws and some tips. Probably the most common is a carpenter saw. So it's a it's a tapered rectangular shape, usually about two feet long with a D handle is what most people think of as a basic hand saw. Mm -hmm. And they come from 24 to 30 inches, probably the most common you'd see in a hardware store. These are for rough cuts in wood. So there's three main styles in a carpenter saw. You have rip, cross cut, and universal. And the teeth are designed to go through the grain of wood differently. Okay. So if you think of a piece of wood being a tight bundle of fibers, so when you see those dark lines, that's the grain running in that direction. Mm -hmm. If you have a rip saw, a rip saw is going to have two to eight teeth per inch. They're going to be bigger teeth, and they're they're styled like a chisel. So they're chiseling out, they're cutting, and this is designed to rip along. So you're going with the fiber in the grain of the wood, okay. And so you're you know cutting parallel to these to the grain. And a cross cut saw is going to have more teeth per inch. So it's going to have ten to twenty in general teeth per inch, little smaller teeth. And they are shaped like little knives, and they're designed to cut across the grain. What type of wood is that for? So this is usually harder wood. And most of these Western saws, you know, most of the the saws that you find in your hardware store are Western style. So that means they're going to cut in the pushing motion. Mm -hmm. So you're pushing down. So uh, with any of these saws, though, a rip saw, you don't have to go parallel. It's just going to be easier to cut parallel? Right, exactly. So if you take a rip saw and you're trying to cross cut with it because the teeth are thicker and it grabs, grabs those fibers, mm-hmm. so the grain, it actually is going to make create a, a rougher cut and it's going to be more difficult. But it's still going to cut. You can still do it, sure, if you're you know muscular like me. <laughs> you can also pick up a hand saw that has 20 to 30 teeth per inch for very hard woods or fine, precise cuts. And on these carpenter saws, the teeth are alternately offset slightly, so it's going to create a cut that's larger than the main body of the blade, and that keeps the blade from binding. And then the basic saw length is 24 to 30 inches, but you can pick up a hand saw that's 15 to 20 inches long, and they usually call that a panel saw. And I was talking to a couple of old timers, and they say that they called it a panel saw because it was designed to fit in the top panel of a toolbox. <laughs> so I couldn't confirm that that's true, but, but that's, what, that's what I was told. 
So on the package, is it going to say the amount of teeth per inch? Usually, yeah. Yeah, the packaging is going to say it. Some of the older saws that we sold would just say rip or cross cut, but now most of the packaging, you're going to see the amount of teeth. The larger teeth and less per inch is going to be cutting with the grain, and the smaller, more teeth per inch is going to be primarily cutting across the grain. So before you mentioned universal. And, and then you have a universal. So on most of the hand saws you're going to get your pushing to cut. And if you get a universal or a double ground, the teeth are sharpened on two sides. So it's primarily cutting as you push down, but it will also cut as you pull back. Mm. And if you see anything that says triple ground, three sides of the teeth are sharpened. So it's cutting on the push and the pull action. So that's very fast cutting. And it actually, most of them do a very good job of creating a very clean cut. And that cut, as you're creating that cut, that's called the kerf, K-E-R-F. I think a cool thing you can get on some saws, if you look at them, is they have 90 degrees or 45 degrees marked on the blade or the handle. Mm -hmm. And so this is designed, you can take the handle and push it up against the wood and you can use that as a guide to create your lines for cutting. Hmm. Which is pretty cool. So using the top of the blade, and you can draw your line with a pencil, and then it has you know the two options. So I think that's just a nice feature if you've got a choice between two saws. And a couple of the top-rated saws that you can pick up, and, and it's funny, a lot of the home centers, you do not have a very wide selection. Right, yeah. You're going to get a much wider selection probably in your local hardware store. But the Stanley Fat Max... It has hardened blades. They're triple ground. That's probably one of the highest rated hand saws. The Irwin Universal. It's a rip and cross cut. They say that it has less flex because of the thickness of the blade itself, and it's coated, so it's going to move smoothly through the wood. And then DeWalt has a really nice, uh, highly rated hand saw. It's triple ground. It has a coated blade and hardened teeth. I've seen this really weird looking saw that has the by the teeth, you know, normal teeth, and then it's almost like a divot. Right, a gullet. So what is that? <laughs> so it's cool. So Who it would know that word? Yeah, weird. What is it? Weird. So as you as you saw, the chips get caught up in that little indentation, and then as you pass through the wood, it drops out. Huh. So it allows you to move the saw through the material faster, and it just has a cleaner cut. So that's kind of a cool. So that's not a bad thing to look for, too, if you have these little indentations along the cutting edge. What tips do you have for using a handsaw? So I would know what side of the line, if you're drawing a line on your wood, what side of the line you're so cutting to. the first to. thing is you should draw a line. So draw a line, <laughs> have a pencil, <laughs> and uh, use a straight edge. Or if you have a, a handsaw with the markings on it, you can use the top of the blade to make your line. If you're cutting really delicate wood, I would put painter's tape over it. I would put my line on top of the tape. And then I would use a razor knife to score it. And that way you're not going to chip up. You're going to get a nice clean cut. I would use, on the supporting hand that you're holding the wood with, I would use my thumb to guide the blade of the saw. And then on, on, the cut, on your cutting hand, if you extend your forefinger, it actually helps you guide and control the blade. And then when you're starting your cut, you're going to draw the blade backwards. And so you're just letting the, the weight of the blade do the work. And you're just starting to score the wood. And then you want long, smooth strokes. You're trying to use the whole blade because it's going to help maintain a sharp edge through the whole length of the blade, and it's going to give you more control. And then for most cutting, you know, you're supporting your wood, let's say, on a... A, a sawhorse? A saw, thank you. A sawhorse. Hey, hey. And, I never really thought about that before. <laughs> used for sawing? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> So you're primarily holding it for a cross cut. You're holding your saw at a 45 degree angle down. So the end of the blade is pushing down into 45. And for ripping along the length of the grain, you're going to hold it at about 60 degrees. What if you're not good at degrees? <laughs> get, a, get a protractor? <laughs> is it a protractor or a compass? <laughs> and then if you're trying to get really accurate cuts, you'd use a miter box. And a miter box is great for small pieces of wood, so molding and trim. And it's going to not only help you guide, but give you very exact cuts. So if you have to make 45 degree angles, it, it does a, a very nice job. And it holds the wood really nice, too. Yeah. And then I would say keep your blades protected. So use a binder edge, you know, like for the little binders. Um, you can take that plastic edge. Great for keeping your, your the teeth on your saw protected. Or you can run to the hardware store and grab some vinyl tu tubing. 
-hmm. and I like three eighths OD or half inch tubing and cut that to length and then cut it all the way down on one side with a razor knife and then you can just put that right over the the blade which is really nice in a toolbox or you know anywhere you're storing your blades it's going to keep your hand from getting cut up and then it also helps and add some life to the saw. Which I wish we would do that because there is a I went into a box where we keep a bunch of our materials right and you had the japanese pull saw that has you know teeth on both sides and uh-huh. that so it's just loose and i mean i almost cut off my whole hand <laughs> so it'd be not, we should do a video on that we though. should always use <laughs> tubing on your teeth a very versatile saw you can get is a japanese pull saw and this cuts what history do you have about the japanese pull saw ancient Japanese people designed a pull saw <laughs> and it's 75% thinner than a western saw and it is a very flexible blade so it's great for a lot of different projects and that pulling action if you can visualize that you're pulling the blade and pulling it straight mm-hmm. so you can create just a, a crazy precise cut so all other hand saws it's on the push most hand saws are push motion and they have to have a, a stiffer thicker blade and the problem is if you don't have a perfect stroke as you're going through the wood and if you push in an angle at all it can bind that blade and so it, it means it like stops right exactly. yeah it's terrible so the pull saw really does a nice job and in fact we did that project in your condo when we were putting in a new countertop Mm -hmm. we had to put a small notch in the corner of it so in fact on our fix at home improvement channel on youtube i took your we have a formica countertop and we had to cut out a notch maybe two inches by one inch and we used the japanese pull saw and it did a beautiful job and with that too i used tape over the formica and i used a razor knife to score it But then this did a nice job. And we used a Japanese pull saw that had two sides. So it has a cross cut side and Mm -hmm. it has a rip side. So it's a a very versatile saw. Which I never even knew it existed until we started the kitchen remodel. And I mean, it just does an amazing job. Yeah, I I love it. It, You get a lot of control and it it is very precise. And in comparison of how hard you have to work with other hand saws, I mean... This yeah. seemed really easy. I, think it's I mean, great... I didn't do anything, but I mean, it seemed really easy. <laughs> but I think for, for most homeowners, if you're looking for something very versatile, it's a little different mentality because you're pulling. A lot of guys suggest as you're pulling down, you're, the handle's going down towards the floor. And you're also, in most applications, you're using a very flat angle. And you can really follow the cut, mm-hmm. you know, or you follow your line and get a very precise cut. And then because that blade is so flexible, let's say we're putting tile or a laminate floor down and we have to cut the molding around, let's say, a door. Mm -hmm. You can put your tile up to the door, lay this Japanese pull saw flat against it. You can flex up the handle and you can cut up your molding so that your tile or flooring goes right up to it. It just, it's a very, very nice design. And then a couple of the top rated ones are shark saw. And this has a lacquered blade. This was one of the first ones I bought years ago. It has a removable blade. And then Irwin, DeWalt, and Stanley Fat Max Mm -hmm. all have highly rated pull saws. Now, if you're doing a lot of projects around the house where you're cutting molding and trim or you're doing fine woodworking where you're creating tenons, you can get a a tenon. Tenon, so for joints, so you have a mortise and a tenon. So it, it creates, a, if you're doing furniture, you're, the mortise is the hole and the tenon is a tongue that goes into that. So you're creating a joint. Carpenters have been using that for thousands of years, cutting a hole and then cutting so you a... So the ancient Egyptians used absolutely. it? Absolutely. They love the mortise and tenon. <laughs> so you can buy a back saw, B-A-C-K, or a miter saw, or a tenon saw. And generally... you spell those? Tenon, T-E-N-O-N. <laughs> and uh, you generally use this with a miter box... These are usually rectangular shaped blades with a nice handle about 14 inches long, usually about 12 teeth per inch, and this creates really nice fine cuts. And what's interesting about this is it has a reinforced top, so the top part of the blade, the opposite from the teeth, has this thicker frame that holds it rigid so, right. it, so it doesn't flex. So you can't cut through wood with this. So if you're trying to cut like a big piece of wood, mm-hmm. that that stop that top frame would stop it. <laughs> but perfect for if you're doing molding and trim and using a miter box. Another saw you can pick up if you're doing a lot of molding around the house is a coping saw, C-O-P-I-N-G. 
And a coping saw is, it has a frame that's shaped like a big upside down U and it holds a very thin replaceable hardened steel blade. And this will allow you to cut angles and curves. Usually about six inches deep is this frame and then the blade is, is usually six inches long. You, in general, probably the most common is 32 teeth per inch, so it does very fine cuts. And it allows you to create a coped corner rather than a mitered corner. Why don't you explain the difference? So a mitered corner, you're generally going to use a miter box and you're going to cut, let's say we're doing baseboard, you're going to cut a 45 on two pieces of wood that fit into an inside corner. And if you use a coped corner and a coping saw, what you're going to do is you're going to cut one length of the baseboard flush up to the wall, and then you're going to trace the shape of the molding on the second piece of wood, and you're going to use a coping saw, and you're going to cut that curved shape, and you're going to butt it up right to it. So it's just going to make a, just a, a great looking corner. So where would you use this? So primarily in older homes, if you don't have square walls, and you know, in fact, a lot of homes don't have square <laughs> walls. So if you put in a mitered corner, sometimes that opens up and you don't get a, a great looking corner. Right. So a coped corner is just going to be beautiful. It looks perfect. So this is one of the few saws that you can get a replacement blade for? It, it has a very thin blade that's replaceable, and it also, a coping saw cuts on the pull stroke. Hmm. Now, if you're working on projects, let's say putting in kitchen cabinets or bathroom cabinets, you can get a keyhole saw. Or any a, kind of cabinets? Any kind of cabinets. Or a, any kind of cabinets where you need to create a hole. <laughs> or a jab saw. And this is a thin wedged blade with either a straight handle or a pistol grip style. It almost looks like a steak knife. Mm -hmm. And I, I love these four projects where you, you have to make a hole for either electrical or plumbing pipe. So you would pre-drill with a drill, create a hole, and then you would jab this into the hole and start cutting, mm -hmm. and, it, and it gives you really nice, precise control. In fact, uh, Klein Tools has a six inch, they call it their jab saw, and this is designed for plywood, drywall, plastic. It has a hardened carbon steel blade, and it's triple ground. So it cuts on the push and the pull, so mm -hmm. it, it was very highly rated. And then Stanley Fat Max, has one of these keyhole saws that have a 12 inch blade and a pistol grip so for you know big projects and right. they have triple ground teeth and this one has 11 teeth per inch and this this will is good for cutting quickly through plywood the keyhole saw looks very similar to a drywall saw yeah and you can use it as a drywall saw but if you're looking for a specific drywall saw sometimes they call it a wall board saw it has a very narrow tapered blade with a really fine tip so that you can plunge it into drywall mm -hmm. or I usually you know grab the handle and I hit it with the palm of my hand to drive it in they usually don't need to ever be sharpened in fact you know that old one you've seen me use it's probably right. you know 30 years old 100 years old exactly and uh, I've never and sharpened down it from generation to generation <laughs> Third generation of Elsa. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just very easy to use. Some have one side, some have two sides. You can get plastic or wooden handle. But it's definitely better than using a razor knife. If you're doing drywall mm -hmm. work and you're cutting out boxes for electric, I would definitely use a drywall saw rather than a razor knife. One saw that we haven't talked about yet is a hacksaw. So a hacksaw has a U-shaped frame. It holds a thin replaceable blade, primarily for cutting metal. It doesn't do a great job on wood. but Why not? You it, it flexes too much. You're not going to get a real nice, precise cut. Hmm. But great for, you know, different types of steel, masonry, tile, plastic. You know, I've used it for cutting wire and cable. For a general guide, 14 teeth per inch is good for wood and metal. 18 teeth per inch for heavy metal. 24 teeth per inch for medium metal and conduit projects. 32 teeth per inch for thin, hollow tubing and light aluminum. And then for cutting ceramic tile, it's pretty cool. You can replace that blade with a carbide cutting rod, and it'll cut through ceramic, steel, plastic, brick. So if you're making little shapes, if you're doing a, a tile project. And then what's also cool is you can, let's say that you have to create a, an interesting shape in the center of a tile. Mm -hmm. You can drill a hole in this, and then you can put this rod through it, you know, disconnect it from the frame of the hacksaw, push the rod through there, reconnect it to the frame and then because that rod cuts all the way around mm -hmm. you can cut a shape in the center of tile 
So Interesting. it's pretty cool. Yeah. So there's a lot of different blades you can get for a hacksaw. For new homeowners who are just setting up their toolbox, okay. what kind of saws would you recommend for them? I think a good western style carpenter saw is just nice to have around the house because you can do window, door and trim molding, baseboard if you have tree limbs or you know just projects around the house. If you're cutting just some scrap wood for a project, I would look for something that says universal or triple ground. And then for more delicate work or more accurate work, I would either have a miter saw with a miter box or I'd pick up one of these Japanese pull saws. I really like the two-sided. They're going to be the most versatile. If you plan on doing a lot of remodeling, I would have a keyhole saw, a drywall saw, and a hack saw. Do you have anything else to add? I would also cover the teeth of my hand saw with uh, plastic tubing or vinyl tubing. Or hang them on the wall so you don't cut your hand off when you're going into a toolbox. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> and then we're going to listen. I'm going to fade out with Peter from MusicalSaw.com playing the saw. And he sells musical saws on his site and also some other interesting items. It's exciting. So let's wrap this up. You can subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you could subscribe there as well. If you'd like to email us, you can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week.